My name is Eric Andron. I was born in February of 1952 in Torrance, California. Oh, I chose to go to West Point because it was academics that I knew I couldn't afford. And it was a good way to get away from home and not be burdened by the encumbrances of economics and other things. And also I, I revered the idea of doing something that seemed good. It just had a good feeling. It seemed like it would turn out good to do something with so much direction. Well, the Vietnam War was being protested nationwide. It was uh, at the forefront of the news. People were outside the gates of West Point sometimes protesting. One of the things that I liked about the idea of going to West Point is it would uh, totally, I felt it would point me in the right, right direction and that they would sort of control what I should do and that would make me successful. I felt that I needed a little external guidance or to do the right thing and I thought West Point would be the place to get it. Before I left for West Point, I was smoking marijuana several times per week. Uh, going into the military, my plan was to stop doing marijuana and never do it again. I knew I'd have to stop and that's about all the thought I really gave it. I was an air defense officer for two years at Fort Bliss, Texas. At the time when I was a Fort Bliss Air Defense Officer, I was attempting to enter dental school. And I actually succeeded in 1976, proceeded back to New Jersey where I uh, attended dental school for four years. I started using marijuana during my second year, I believe it was, as a dental student. Uh, all the dental students were using it. We'd have social events as dental students, even with the administrators of the dental school. And even in the mid-70s, many of the students and some of the administrators were smoking marijuana. I believe a 70s army, I don't think they would have looked at the use of marijuana in the ways that an 80s army looked at the use of marijuana. It was, it had totally changed the way that it it was looked at. In the 70s, the Army's view on marijuana appeared to be pretty liberal when President Carter was president. I think what changed was uh, when um, Ronald Reagan became president, it was practically like overnight the view on marijuana changed. I actually felt that marijuana enabled me to to cope with that, the job of being a dentist. And I felt that, uh, especially after my father died, my grandfather died, it uh, helped to be a great stress reliever and um, helped me do the things that I felt I had to do to be a good dental officer. My father was from Sweden and by the time I was in dental school, he'd returned back to Sweden. I visited my father in the summer of 79 and uh, found that he was drinking very, very, very excessively. And when I returned to the States to complete dental school, I found it very depressing to have visited my father. I'd always thought it would have been an uplifting experience. And just to see, uh, Marijuana to me at that time seemed like a medicine that would have saved the life of my father who had died in Sweden inevitably of alcohol. When I visited him several years before, there was such heavy drinking. The way I used to feel about alcohol use in the military versus marijuana use was that it seemed, it just didn't seem correct that the military should be able to compel somebody to use a substance which is more harmful, which I believe was alcohol. I believe it should have been flipped around the other way. 
that if anything, alcohol should have been more, alcohol I considered more dangerous than marijuana, the morbidity and mortality. I never considered myself a drug dealer. I considered myself as somebody that could get marijuana and uh, we shared marijuana and sometimes I would pick it up for my friend and sometimes he, he would pick up some for me and that was, it was pretty common that we would share marijuana and not charge anybody for it. During the, during the, in December, the agents would come to me and they'd, we'd sit there. I, I didn't know they were agents. It was one of the individuals was, had been transferred from Germany and his wife was still in Germany. And the other undercover agent, he, he introduced me to a couple days later because I said I wouldn't obtain marijuana, I think. I think he wanted to have more people and more time. But the second agent was an unemployed carpenter and we'd smoke marijuana and it seemed every time they would always ask me, would I get some for them? And I said, no, you've got to find it yourself. And then maybe they'd phone or come by and say, we looked for marijuana, we can't find it. Can you get some for us? And I said, no, and we'd smoke some marijuana. And marijuana was so important in my life to deal with what I was doing that eventually I felt sorry for them. And I, I started to feel like a heel. No, here I, oh, I have marijuana. I know where I can get marijuana. I'm not gonna get any for you. Yeah. Eventually I felt like I had to get it for them because I thought their suffering would be the same as mine. If I was asking somebody for weeks, hey, could you get me some? I, I couldn't see how somebody could say no because they seemed to emulate, they seemed to have the same reaction that I had. They seemed to be depressed and need marijuana. That's why I thought they would ask me for it and ask and come by and ask to smoke with me. The day I was arrested, I was, um, it was very, very traumatic to realize I would be facing 25 years incarceration for having obtained marijuana several times for these individuals. The CID agent said that every time he came, he visited my house, he said that every time I talked to him, I said, I can get you 500 hits of LSD and I can get you marijuana. I just don't have it now. And this is what he told the jury, that every time he confronted me, even the first time I met him, I told him this and it just simply wasn't true. The worst thing that I did was breaking a rule. The break, I broke, I never denied that I did, that I did break a rule and that I did obtain some, something for somebody. But that, I think that was the worst thing that I did. Because you're never, if you break a rule, there's never an excuse. There is never in the military. When you get to West Point, they tell you there's four answers. Yes, sir, no, sir, sir, I do not know. <laughs> and no excuse, sir. Going into sentencing, I thought, Perhaps the military would just give me therapy. Um, I had no idea I would receive, that the jury would give me a 10 year sentence. It was just a real eye opener. The jury at that trial in 1982, the perception they received, it was completely wrong. They believed everything the prosecution said was true. They believed I couldn't do dentistry uh, they believed I was a full-fledged drug dealer and the jury also believed that I had faked insanity. The jury couldn't have received a more inaccurate uh, representation of myself as a, as a defendant because I had obtained marijuana. But the main, th one of the main thing I would want a jury member to know <laughs> was that I know I didn't fake insanity. 
And I'd also want them to, I'd also want to show the jury members some of those, uh, any of the officer efficiency reports I had during my four years of service, which would show that the jury was totally mis, um, misled in this regard. As I recall, it was the, the maximum sentence any officer had received for any drug offense up until my incarceration there in, in, at Fort Leavenworth. The next day after I was incarcerated, my defense attorney came to me and um, he told me that the judge had told him that that was the worst defense he had heard in 14 years on the bench. And my defense attorney asked if I was going to ask for inadequacy of defense counsel. It was about 2005 when I felt that I needed to look at everything in retrospect because I, I really needed to look back at the defense of innocent by reason of insanity because I, I knew that my lawyer had been so earnest and I actually wondered for decades what it was he'd really tried to do and where it had gone. So I compiled the diaries that I had over from my life from the beginning and put that into um, prelude to a court martial leading up to um, the trial. That part is in the record that I kept of a diary and the trial itself is in Vigilante and Gray. I wanted to look back at what happened because I felt that I didn't really understand what had happened at my trial. And I felt that if I didn't understand what had happened at my trial, having been a West Point graduate, there must be a lot of other people who are court-martialed who don't understand what happens at their trial. People need to know that the justice system isn't probably, how can the justice system be perfect? There's so many human emotions that go into this thing. There's different witnesses and you're literally at the mercy of a defense lawyer the same way somebody is at the mercy of a dentist. You just, you know, you expect to get good, you know, the best care, the best representation. And it's just too easy for that to be manipulated when you have, when somebody's facing 25 years, doesn't have a legal background. Um, you rely on a, on a defense lawyer like you rely on a pilot of a plane, really, or, a, or the driver of a Greyhound bus. It's, I just like people to know that the system can make big mistakes, that's all. It's, you know, I made mistakes, I, and the legal system made some big mistakes. I think there's a lot of people nationwide who are in jail for marijuana offenses, and with it becoming legalized, I think their sentences should be drastically reduced, or they should just be, be released. It's a waste of money. What are you gonna teach these guys about marijuana? That if they're in jail for marijuana, what, do, what, do you, what does that teach? That they're using something safer than alcohol? I mean, it was interesting to visit Seattle, just visited Seattle just yesterday, and. Um, where marijuana now is completely legal and to walk into a store and buy a marijuana cigarette or a marijuana brownie. It's, it's just totally different to, to see that, to have done so many years in prison over something that was so feared. It's just so important that people know that people can be misled, they can be as easily misled into endorsing a war that's for no reason. Well, if that can happen, a jury of 10 people within three days can be convinced of somebody's guilt. We've, this country has seen how the Vietnam War was unnecessary. We've seen how the war on the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq 
was unnecessary. And now we're starting to see how the war on marijuana was unnecessary. I just like people to know that the justice system isn't perfect and that it made a big mistake in my case.